Good morning. My name is David Daniel with the Centerville Press, and uh, we're working on uh, documenting the, a living history of the uh, events that occurred 50 years ago on uh, May the 22nd. Uh, or was it? It was May, wasn't it? May yeah, but I think it's 27. 27. Yeah, I think you said. Okay, that. enunciate. You said 22 <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. Well, uh, second and seventh sound similar. Yeah. Um, 50 years ago, we're doing a uh, uh, booklet and also a website, and we're trying to uh, accumulate an overall picture of the events of that day because uh, it was such an uh, important event in the county's history and also in a lot of people's lives, and a lot of uh, things occurred that the generations coming behind us won't know about if we don't tell them. So we've got another gentleman here today with us that I'm very grateful for that uh, was actually present that day where the tornado occurred and he's uh, willing to share with us what he knows. And I want to welcome Alvin George to the Centerville Press video uh, website. And uh, thank you for being here, Alvin. Yeah, thank you for asking. I appreciate it. I'll tell us a little bit about yourself. Now tell us where, where, where you come from. What was your childhood? Uh, who your parents were, and did you have any friends? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I was actually born in Beaumont, Texas. Really? Yes. I did not know that. Stayed there. Actually, I moved several different places, but that's where I was born and went back there. That's where my dad passed away. At Who was your dad? Ollie George, Jr. What did he do? What kind he of? He worked with computers back then. Really? Like, Interesting. Actually, I had he, no he, idea. Was, he had some machinist background also. CAD type things? Computer animated? No, uh, that computer was half big of this room. You know, the whole, it, another it whole had, story it, there. It, it had the cards that punched the holes in. He's back in the mainframe days. So, uh, moved from there to, after he passed away, I went to well, I actually went to Tennessee. He worked there for a while. Where in Tennessee? Memphis. Didn't stay there long when he got sick. We went back to Texas, and then after he passed away, we moved to Mobile. You kind of got around, didn't moved you? Moved from Mobile to Shreveport, Louisiana. Well, it sounds like your house was almost in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, I came here when I was 13. Well, how did you how, how did you and Sharon uh, cross paths and get acquainted? She was... And are y'all still getting along? Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> Sharon was a little sister of one of my best friends. And you know, we all rode motorcycles and carried on. And she was always in the background until she grew up. And she caught your eye, yeah, didn't she? Yeah, she <laughs> Well, and that's been a good thing, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, I got me a friend like that. Married in nineteen. You know what I told my wife recently? I said, darling, we've celebrated our 49th anniversary, and I'm right fond of you. <laughs> my will be. I said, if we keep this up, we'll be friends. <laughs> well, go ahead now. That, that's, your, that's your upbringing, your, your uh, youth. How did you come to Bibb County? That's when I was 13. I moved in with my aunt and uncle, Margie and C.W. Dunlap. Where did y'all live? Down on the Hayshop Creek, down in Brent. A little house on the right before you get to the creek. You kind of country, then, wasn't you? Pretty much. <laughs> and then after that, mother moved. She moved and... Who's your mother? Was Rebecca George. Who was she before she married? She was a king. Where is she from? In uh, Louisiana. Now, how many brothers and sisters or siblings have you got? I've got two older sisters. Where do they live? One's in Minnesota and one's in Birmingham. Well, Y'all just sound like Americans to me. <laughs> That's it. Well, tell us about uh, you growing up in Bibb County. Where'd you go to school? I started in the uh, Bibb County Junior High. Went through the 10th grade and then I went to, finished in Marion at Perry Christian. 
which was a little private school down there. That's where I graduated. Well, you've uh, you, your career has been in. Uh, tell us about your work. What do you do? I own a machine shop. Started that in. Well, I actually started went to trade school at Bessemer State Technical College, and then worked several jobs, and then went in business in 1983. Well, you've been a you've been a uh, ever since. you've been a kind of a standard in this area for the yeah. type of work that you guys do. I know uh, quite a number of the <laughs> industries around this area have called upon your company for services and help to keep them operating. So uh, I know you have a good reputation yeah. and a good reputation in the area and in the, the state for that matter. We try to we we do work all over. Up in North Carolina. And you yeah. work too, don't you? We work. Yeah. <laughs> Not hard as I used to, but I, Well that's all right. You can slow I down got, a little you can slow good, down a little bit. You got a good employees. You're blessed that you got that, yeah. sir. That's a blessing for sure. Well tell us what uh, what you were doing on the day that the tornado came through. Tell us about uh, the events right prior to the tornado, if you would. Well, as we all did in my teenage years, <laughs> we hung out in the parking lot over in where Savemore is. I'm not sure it was called Savemore then, uh, but that's just where Why did us guys used to hang out in the parking lot? Just so we could see I, if a girl would drive by, yeah, right? Yeah, we could see everything that came by. It, <laughs> it was either that or you rode uptown through the Dairy Queen. And if there wasn't uptown. enough of them riding, if there wasn't enough of them riding by, we'd get in the car and ride around. That's wouldn't? right. Yeah, and I remember them days. And I think, best I can remember, you know, they were talking tornadoes in the area. And What was the day like? It, it was, was Sunday, of, wasn't it? It was kind of weird. I have heard numerous yeah. people talk about how strange the day seemed to be prior to the tornado. Never, never seen some of the things. You know, we were sitting there and, you know, the clouds would be going one way wind be blowing the opposite way and this was way before the tornado ever hit you yeah know? Uh, and then i guess right before you know it hit you you could look back towards brent and you could it just looked like a huge cloud you know on the dark cloud and it started raining and it rained raindrops huge. Never seen them like that. Where were you located when it came through? I left the parking lot. At Savemore. Yeah. And started to Brent. So you were me and the tornado. You liked to run into it. No, didn't we you? did run into it. You did it. run into it. <laughs> well tell us about that. I ran into it about where Mr. Johnny Meggs and his house was, not far from the parking lot. I still didn't know it was a tornado. Couldn't stop the car. It wouldn't stop. It just blowing. Never busted the windows, but it blew trash, pine straw on the inside of the car. So I just, I threw it up and parked, laid down in the seat. Thought and you were going to ride, didn't you? I went by Miss Margaret Suttle's mother in the house, Miss Duke's house, and Afterwards, I, I stopped right before you get to the Brent Baptist Church. That's where I stopped at. And Mr. Jim Suttle, I remember him telling me, he said, I saw you come by six, eight feet off the ground. So <laughs> when you stopped, and got, when, you, when you stopped your car, did you get out in a different place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still. Well, then you really didn't stop your car, did no, you? No, <laughs> I didn't stop it. It, it just stopped. And of course, when imagine. I got out and looked around, you could see, you know, the church was gone. There wasn't a telephone pole standing anywhere or light poles or anything. It, it, it was, it kind of hit you kind of what happened then. Well, what did, what, I know at that time you had to have been totally confused and disoriented, but what did you do after that you got out? Well, the first thing I went, check on, you know, my mother and my aunt and, you know, to make sure all of them were fine. And 
you know, luckily, you know, just damage to the house and all, but other than that, you know, nobody was hurt. And of course, then we just went, started going from place to place in groups, you know, just looking. Trying to verify where everybody was yeah. and wh whether or not anybody That's was hurt. right. Well, did you go on over to the church? I went by it to start with and then when came back that way, you know, they kind of had it. You really, there really wasn't a whole lot of church there, you know. I know we've got pictures. You've seen you've seen these pictures, haven't you? Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, we're gonna be put we're gonna be putting some pictures up for everybody to see. Um, well, where, what happened after that, Alvin? Where did you go? Well, actually, I I had my I was living up in Centerville, and I couldn't I couldn't use my car, but I had my motorcycle. Did it tear, did it tear your car up? It beat it up pretty good. It was drivable, but you couldn't go nowhere. So I went, ran back, to, you know, across the river over here and got my motorcycle and where I could get around. So just, you know, we just went from place to place for days and still hunting and make sure everything was, everybody was. It took, it took some time to do an did. inventory of where everything was and what was uh, still standing. Yeah, because it, it was just, it's just amazing, you know, there just wasn't nothing left. Well, now, we're using, we're using the statement, the day that time stood still, and I, I think I'm getting a picture from what I'm hearing from everybody, that on that day, it was such a traumatic change in everything that it was disoriented. People seemed like they were disoriented and they didn't know where to go or what well, to do. You know, a lot of people didn't have nowhere to go. You know, they didn't. They, they didn't have a home. They didn't well, did have you anything. did you see the community coming together to yeah. try to help people? Oh, yeah. And were there uh, people from out of town coming in to they help? They did. People brought. You know, it wasn't wasn't very long. I think Red Cross set up in Brent. You know, and with water and you yeah. know different things like that. So it's just. Uh, Something that's in your mind you won't ever forget. Kind of just frozen in there, yeah. isn't it? That's what that's what I think I mean by uh, time standing still. It's it's stuck there. It, it, you'll it. never forget it, will no. you? What kind of car was it? Seventy two Grand Torino. <laughs> what size was the motor? Three fifty one Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I ask him questions, <laughs> don't you? Because that's what every boy was doing during that time was. Either working on a car or trying to get a car, wasn't yeah. it? That's what boys did. Yeah, we did that. I think it was something in our head that you couldn't have a girlfriend if you didn't have a car. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we were going to do is get a car. <laughs> well, yes. I, I'm a little older than you are, but my generation was doing the same, same thing. The same thing. Well, I used to tag around when all the older ones left. <laughs> But I, you know, I, I worked in Birmingham. I worked was working at a Sipco pipe, you know, and I guess it was probably two weeks before I before I went back to work. And of course, they were real good about it. How long did it take to kind of get back to some sense of normalcy there in Brent? Probably two or three weeks before you could really actually travel Draft, around you know, and get around and then there were still places you couldn't you know you did couldn't you know go. any of the people that that uh perished in the tornado oh uh, yeah i knew mr clyde mitchell's dad and uh, mr bill dial's wife you know she she lost her leg in there just lucky there wasn't more than that well, uh, after the tornado, what was your recovery like? Did you, where y'all lived and the places that your your family lived, were they any of them damaged? The, I, on my aunt and uncle's house, they had, you know, redo the roof and stuff. But other than that, it, it wasn't major stuff. So. Just, you know, we just tried to. Just tried to help the community all you know all we could. 
You know, you know I, have all, I have spoken to this with some other people that have come here. I, as I'm talking to you folks that were eyewitnesses that went through the tornado, I'm, I'm realizing there's some real uh, common things that I seem to be hearing. One about the time stood still. Um, another is that the community came together in a way that was uh, amazing and impressive as to helping each other um, and also uh, the, the help that came from out of, out of town. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I noticed when I first moved to Bibb County in 1978 that the Brent community and the people that lived in Brent seemed to have a strong, really rock hard uh, concept of their community and their oneness in the community and the value of their community. If there's anything that good came out of it that I've been able to see, I would say it's that the community is strong, which came together stronger after the tornado than probably, probably before the tornado. Probably so. You think that'd be true? That'd be true. You know, and they called, the, of course, the National Guard, they called them out. And I, best I remember, there was a probably a 10 o'clock curfew or something, you know, couldn't, couldn't stay out. And, wasn't no need to stay out. There wasn't nothing, <laughs> wasn't much to do. Well, I, I'm going to call on you a little bit deep here. We're speaking and doing the things we're doing here today because we, we recognize that there'll be generations behind us that won't know what it was like to have that sense of community. Is there anything you would speak to them about how to, how to have community and, and so forth? Because with social media and everything that's going on, it seems like there's a, a disassociation of the typical community that you and I knew and grew up in, where you, if you got to know somebody, you had to sit down with them and look them in the eye. Yeah. Today, with social media, people call themselves a part of some community <laughs> on social media, and they don't even know who the people are that are with them. I, I think social media has put a damper on our society. I think it's... Uh, it's good, don't get me wrong, but it's, it has its good part. It, 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 it's it's bad, and I see that especially with young kids, and they'll never see the things that we grew up seeing. Uh, well, in a, in growing up, you need uh, you need an older person that you can trust that will help you kind of figure out what it is to get along because older people tend to have a little more experience yeah. than younger people. And you need somebody your age that you're friends with, and then you need somebody that uh, you're helping along yourself a little bit, That's I think. Right. And well, I would recommend uh, uh, to the young folks, if you, if you don't have somebody that's older than you that you respect and you can talk to, find them. Uh, bother them until they pay you some attention, because every young person coming up this this was something that I experienced in my life. You need somebody that's older than you that you can trust and you can ask questions to and get some idea of what it is. I, I had a fellow named Mr. Charlie Hafner that I respected very much. He was much older than I, but I would ask him questions and he never failed to answer them uh, because he, he, he gave a little bit of himself to me and encouraged me to do things a certain way and... Uh, I think everybody, if, you, if you're if you young and you don't have an older person you trust, find somebody. And if you are not with someone that's a friend of yours that you can trust and share your life with and share experiences, find somebody. You need to be a part of a community. And in doing that, you also need to have somebody that's younger than you that trusts you and that you try to help. I think we all need that. Uh, and my life is proof of that. Did you have someone in your life that was older than you that you trusted and admired and went to for advice? And I did. I actually had, of course, you know, my mother never remarried. Yeah. And not until after I got out of high school. And when I moved here, I immediately, I went to work with Mr. Joe Patrick down at Brent Service Station. Well, there's a story there all on Well, him. tell us about that. And, and then tell us about the service station. I've heard no, a lot about well, it. Well, everybody hung out there. I mean, that everybody was, was all the guys, right? That, that was it, right there. <laughs> and what did and they do there? We just hung out. Hung out. 
and watch people work on their cars yeah, and help each other work yeah, on their cars. Pump gas, you know, wash cars. Joe Patridge uh, was a, was that kind of friend I'm talking about and to a great number of boys, and you must have been one of them too. And then I moved on a little out of that and went to work for Mr. Jim Suttle. At Mr. In Jim a, Suttle. In auto and parts I, at that time. And even after I went in business, I talked to him just about every day. I'll bet you that by watching these older men and how they lived their lives and how they treated each other and how they treated other people made you into the kind of businessman that you are today because you probably use those same things you learned from those folks to run your business and your business has been very successful and I congratulate well, you on it. You're you're a you're a standard here in this community. I appreciate it. And then we had I had a lot of good people in my life. Yeah. And of course those two <clears throat> kind of stand out, you know. There uh, there are others that have named those same people. You know, I kind of grew up in the subtle house. <laughs> I stayed there as much as I did at home, so you know, they they just like my second family. Well, Alvin, I appreciate you coming up here today to do this. I know all of us are a little uncomfortable when we realize that there's a one-eyed monster sitting over <laughs> here that's recording everything we're saying. But it's important that the older generations, which includes you and me and, and others around here, step up and try to be there for the younger generation <laughs> to help them figure out some of the tricks of the trade in, in, in just how to live and how to conduct yourself when you're in a, a group of people, how to be a community. Right. Our communities are suffering, I think, but it's not the, it's not the cause of social media that's, that's causing it, but the disassociation from one-on-one -on -one contact, one-on-one -on -one sharing your life, sharing your story, sharing your trials and tribulations, your joys and your sufferings, whatever it may be, if you're not sharing it, one-on-one, -on -one, and when I say one-on-one, -on -one, I mean eyeball-to-eyeball, eyeball, side by side right. you're really not in a community. You're on, a, you're on an electronic... Let me, ask, let me ask the young people this. If you, think, if you think you're involved in a community now and a part of the community, the community is all the people in the community. The older ones, the middle-aged ones, the younger ones, they're all your community. If you're not a part of that community, why not? Is it because of electronic media? If it is, let me ask you this question. If the power went off and we didn't have any electronic media, would you be still be a part of, of a community? If the answer is no, then you're not a part of a community. Get involved in your community. Find someone that's older than you that you can listen to, that you admire and you trust to give you good information and advice on issues, whatever the issues may be. And be a part of a community. Learn from the older generation and, the, and those around you and then help the generation behind you. And I think God will bless your life because that's, a, that's what we're all about. If we're not doing something for someone else, then what are you living your life for? Uh, you really need to have a foot. And you, you and your family have. I... I I appreciate and admire the folks that are coming in and doing this because every one of them have had a footprint in this community and it'll it'll go on for years to come. You've affected a lot of people. You've been involved with a lot of people. You've been a part of a community. And I think communities are extremely important. So I encourage the younger generations to do that. Get involved in your community. Be a, a, a citizen. Do your part to help the community and not tear it apart. You're going to need it. We all do. I thank you. I'm David Daniel with the Centerville Press. Thank you, Alvin. Thank God you. bless you, bro. You too.